I think we're going to get started. I know I'm seeing a couple more people are still joining. Um, I'm going to begin my introduction. So, um, my, hello and welcome. My name is Ingrid Heckel and I'm a conservation and land use specialist with the DEC's Hudson River Estuary Program through a partnership with Hudsonia. I'm sorry, with, Hudson, uh, with Cornell University. We're doing this program today with Hudsonia. Um, welcome to our webinar series. Um, about wetlands. We're really pleased to have you with us. Uh, so of course we'll be meeting this afternoon as well as uh, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon from three to 4.30. Um, and there'll be some optional time at the end for discussional, discussion. Um, this program is being offered through a partnership between the Estuary Program, Cornell, and Hudsonia, uh, and with participation on Wednesday from Emily Svensson of the Law Office of David K. Gordon. And we have a great lineup of presentations and are looking forward to interacting with you over the next couple of days. Um, so I'm going to start off the program just with a short orientation to some of the functions we'll be using on Zoom for anyone who's less familiar uh, with the platform and some background about our program. Um, if you're having any trouble with audio uh, through your computer, you can always call in using your phone. And uh, that number I just provided in the chat box. It was also in the meeting invitation. Um, and you can also reset your audio settings next to the mute button on the lower, late, uh, lower left corner. There's a little arrow you can click and change your speaker input. Um, so the default screen um, may be set to um, speaker view. You can swap between gallery and speaker view on the upper right corner. Um, so right now I'm presenting and you're probably, you should be seeing my screen, um, but we will at other times um, have the opportunity to ask questions and um, you can feel free to share your screen, or share your video and um, switch over to gallery view so you can see the other participants. Um, and we'll also be doing a very short breakout room discussion at the end of this afternoon um, and encourage you to share your video then. Uh, so I'm just showing at the bottom of the screen, you can access the participant window and the chat box. Um, so I've uh, for those of you who are joining late, uh, feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself, provide your name and affiliation, um, and the municipality where you live. And you can also update your name in the uh, participant window um, by clicking more next to your name and then hitting rename. Um, so if you called in on a phone or if your name is showing up uh, funny, um, we encourage you to rename yourself so that we know who you are. Uh, we will be using the participant list to keep track of attendance over the next few days. Um, Um, so just a, a few other notes, please remain muted unless you have a question during a Q&A period. Um, we are recording the webinars and are going to be posting the recorded presentations later on via YouTube. We will edit out the Q&A and discussions from the recordings. Um, and we will provide certificates of attendance for municipal training credit at the end of the program to anyone who requests one. Um, and also note that there will be a link to an online folder that we'll share with um, resources and um, additional reading and guidance and fact sheets. Uh, we'll also post PDFs of the presentations there. Uh, so in a second, I will share that link through the chat box that you have it and we'll also follow up with it later on by email. All right, um, so switching gears, the Hudson River Estuary Program is a unique program at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation established to help people enjoy, protect, and revitalize the Hudson River and its valley. We work throughout the 10 counties bordering the tidal Hudson from Upper New York Harbor to the Federal Dam in Troy to achieve many key benefits of a healthy Hudson River. Um, and our program works primarily through um, grant funding for planning, access and education projects. We do research and provide education and training programs. Uh, we also work on natural resource conservation and protection and restoration projects, and we provide community planning assistance. Um, and uh, 
within SRA program, our conservation and land use team works with municipalities, land trusts, and other partners to incorporate important habitats and natural areas into conservation and land use planning. And uh, as part of that effort, we have had a biodiversity education partnership between the SRA program and Hudsonia uh, for nearly, nearly the last 20 years. Um, and Hudsonia is a local nonprofit environmental education and research institute um, based here in the Hudson Valley. Um, and uh, we've been delivering programs. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we've been delivering programs with Gretchen Stevens, who's with us here today, um, over many years to uh, hundreds of decision makers from municipalities, land trusts, and other organizations and agencies across the region. Um, typically, this would be an in-person, um, kind of hands-on experience, probably a one-day workshop where we would have a combination of lecture, hands-on exercises, a field trip, and lots of discussion. Um, in light of kind of the, the restrictions of this that this pandemic has imposed on us, we've tried to adapt this program and all of those elements as much as possible to this online format um, and are trying to be creative about that. Um, and uh, But of course, we, we've had to move change things up a little bit. Um, so instead of uh, doing a one day program, we've broken this up into three afternoons. Um, we've had to condense a lot of the presentation material. And so we've moved some parts of the program into optional homework assignments. Um, there will be a, a virtual field trip video for you to watch if you would like um, that we'll share the link to, for example. Um, and we will be trying to have some discussion during the, um, the time we're with you here on Zoom, um, but we know people's time is limited. So we've uh, con condensed the Q&A periods during this one and a half hour session, but we're holding an additional half hour open from 4.30 to 5 p.m. each day for anyone who would like to stay on the line and talk further with the presenters um, or discuss any of the, the ideas that came up during the session. Um, so feel free to take advantage of that. And also if you need to hop off and get to other things, we understand. Um, so in addition, we're also considering the possibility of a follow-up day four meeting in October that would cover topics of specific interest to this group um, and, uh, you know, things that we might not get to cover in much detail today, today or during this training. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll ask you more about that later on in the evaluation. Um, so there, there are obviously some downsides to the lack of face-to-face -face interaction and um, hands-on experience, of, of course, um, but on the bright side, we're able to reach many more of you. Um, we see a lot of new, new names here, um, and uh, so we're really pleased about that. Um, and, you know, this is just the second time we're doing an in-depth training like this on Zoom. So we hope you'll be patient with us if we want run into any technical difficulties. Um, and we also welcome any feedback you might have about improvements. Uh, so we'll share an evaluation link on Wednesday after the end of the program. Uh, so lastly, I just want to acknowledge uh, we're in the midst of a challenging time for a lot of people. So let's just take a moment to pause and get ready for the meeting. Um, try to settle in wherever you are. Um, if you can, close your email or any other programs you might have going on, things that might distract you. Um, I invite you to close your eyes if you would like and take a deep breath and just Think about um, why you're here today, why you chose to attend this training, what's important to you, what are you hoping to learn about wetlands or wetland conservation, and just hold that thought. And if you'd like, jot down a few words, um, but we really hope you'll get a lot of out of this training um, and, and that you'll be present with us here and take advantage of the opportunity to interact. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my presentation and um, turn it over to Gretchen Stevens, who is the uh, director of the Biodiversity Resources Center at Hudsonia. Yes, hello. Sorry about that little delay. Um, 
Uh, at Hudsonia, we study the plants and animals and habitats of the region uh, from the perspective of conservation biology. And we try to put the findings uh, of uh, ourselves and those of other researchers uh, into the hands of people like yourselves, especially those in public agencies dealing with land uses, land development and conservation, and people on the staffs of land trusts and other conservation organizations, so that your on the ground planning uh, and decisions can be based on the best up to date science. <clears throat> The topics of the webinar are several uh, and uh, we'll talk about the wetlands here in the Hudson Valley and some aspects of their ecological significance and the many services they provide to the human community. We'll talk about various threats to wetlands and the regulatory protections that are now in place at the state and federal levels. We'll show you uh, where you can find maps and other resources showing where some of the wetlands occur. And we'll show you how by using soil maps, topographic maps and aerial photos <coughs> to predict where many of the unmapped wetlands occur. We'll talk about how to think about and address wetland issues in the course of environmental reviews of land development pro projects uh, and how to incorporate wetland protection into comprehensive plans, open space plans, and local legislation. I'll be talking right now about the values of wetlands for supporting our uh, groundwater and surface water resources and their contributions to local and regional ecosystems. Then Nate Nardi Cyrus will say a few words about <coughs> threats to wetlands and the kinds of measures that can reduce or mitigate those threats. But I need to start <coughs> by explaining what we mean by the term wetland even though state and federal and local uh, wetland regulations differ widely, the term wetland itself has a technical definition that's generally agreed upon at all levels of government. A wetland is a vegetated area with near surface soils, <coughs> that is soils in the rooting zone of plants, that are saturated long enough during the growing season to develop anaerobic conditions and support hydrophytic vegetation. So the, the key factors are these, a wetland must be vegetated. So the open water areas of ponds, lakes, and streams are not technically wetlands under this definition because they are not vegetated. A wetland must have saturated soils for a period long enough during the growing season to support hydrophytic vegetation, that is plants especially adapted to wet conditions. Notice though from this definition that there need not be standing water at any time as long as the soils themselves are saturated. And how long is long enough for, saturate, uh, for, for saturation to develop anaerobic conditions in the soils? That varies uh, according to the soil characteristics, but typically saturated soils <coughs> for as little as one to three consecutive weeks during the growing season is enough to create wetland conditions. Thus, if a vegetated area has near surface soil layer saturated for just three weeks in April, say, but unsaturated for the rest of the growing season, it could qualify as wetland. I emphasize this to drive home the message that wetlands are often not very wet and in their dryish condition are often not easily recognized by the untrained eye or even the trained eye in some cases. Another point I'd like to make <clears throat> is that wetland is a very broad term that covers a host of different wetland types. For example, swamp, marsh, wet meadow, vernal pool, bog and fen are all technical terms for different kinds of wetlands and with each, within each of those are further subcategories of wetlands such as hardwood swamp, conifer swamp, shrub swamp, calcareous wet meadow, poor fen, rich fen and many uh, finer variations but all are encompassed in the term wetland. In a few minutes I'll briefly profile some of the kinds of wetlands that we have here in the Hudson Valley. 
But first I want to talk about the importance of wetlands in general for protecting and replenishing our water supplies, both groundwater, which is the source of most people's drinking water, uh, and surface water, uh, streams, lakes, and ponds. Many of you have heard the statistic uh, that New York State has lost an estimated 60% of its wetlands since European settlement. And I suspect that the actual figure <clears throat> could be much higher. Wetlands have been lost to draining, mainly for agriculture and uh, urban and suburban development, and to filling for construction of buildings, parking lots, roads, and other land development purposes. In addition to the wetland areas that have been lost, many more wetlands have been degraded by fragmentation, pollution, siltation, soil disturbance, and introduction of non-native invasive species. The consequences of these losses to water supplies, the carbon balance, and biological diversity are incalculable. Wetlands play a large role in maintaining our water supplies and storing floodwaters. They are, by definition, places where water is held near the soil surface for a prolonged period. So this provides extended opportunities for water to seep slowly into the ground <clears throat> and also extended interactions with plants and soil uh, microbes, both of which are capable of taking up, breaking down, <clears throat> and transforming pollutants and thus reducing the pollutant levels that reach streams, lakes, and groundwater. Wetlands are also valuable for water storage. During rainstorm and snowmelt event when lots of water is running off the land, the wetlands that are in basins or in floodplains collect and hold water that would otherwise be rushing down streams <clears throat> and causing the large floods that can be so damaging to our developed areas, infrastructure, and, and cropland. Each acre of wetland can hold as much as one and a half million gallons of water. So you can imagine the cumulative water storage capacity of small and large wetlands all over the landscape. Some of the water in wetlands <coughs> uh, seeps into the ground below where it is uh, available to plants uh, and the soil's uh, ecosystem. And some of it may eventually reach the groundwater table this is the water that feeds our drinking water wells, that supplies the base flows of our streams during dry periods, and that emerges as seeps and springs that are important habitats in their own right, and often constitute the outermost headwaters, uh, the very beginnings of our streams. Some of the water in wetlands is taken up by plants, <clears throat> and some evaporates, returning to the atmosphere. Wetland plants take up and use some of the nutrients that might otherwise disrupt the nutrient balance in streams and ponds. And both the plants themselves and the soil fungi, uh, invertebrates, and micro microbes are <coughs> equipped to break down certain pollutants uh, into less harmful constituents. In that way, cleansing the water that reaches streams, ponds, lakes, and groundwater. These processes occur both in wetland and non-wetland environments. Undisturbed wetlands can also store large amounts of carbon. The anaerobic oxygen-free uh, condition of saturated wetland soils greatly slows the rate of decay of plant and animal matter. Slowly decaying organic materials build up in wetlands and the wettest wetlands those that practically never dry up, develop deep layers of these materials called peat or muck, depending on the de degree of decay, <clears throat> as deep as several to many meters in some places. The peat or muck is very high in carbon content and in this way the wetlands store large amounts of carbon that would otherwise be released to the atmosphere <clears throat> as CO2, one of the primary drivers of global warming. If the wetland is drained or the soils disturbed, the exposure to oxygen suddenly speeds up the decay and oxidation, releasing large amounts of CO2 in the process. But maintaining wetlands intact and undisturbed will maintain their services for capture and storage of large amounts of carbon. <clears throat> 
It's been estimated <clears throat> that wetlands that which occupy only five to eight percent of the Earth's land surface hold 20 to 30 percent of the global soil carbon. So I've just mentioned the importance of wetlands to the, the quantity and quality of surface water and groundwater supplies and to carbon sequestration which would be reasons enough to value them highly for these direct services to us in the human community. <clears throat> but there's more. Uh, they are also important contributors to biological diversity, supporting many plant and animal species that live only in wetlands, and many more that use wetlands for certain parts of their life cycles. The great variety of wetland types supports a huge array of wildlife and plants, including some species that are highly specialized to specific habitat conditions. That is, they occur within a very particular kind of wetland with its particular pattern of water depth and water fluctuations, its plant community, and its adjacent and nearby habitats. I'll say a few words about some of the biodiversity of Hudson Valley wetlands, beginning with swamps. <clears throat> First of all, the term swamp in its technical sense means a wetland dominated by woody vegetation, that is trees or shrubs. Uh, a hardwood swamp is a wetland dominated by deciduous trees. This is the most common and widespread kind of wetland in the region. It typically has trees such as red maple, green ash, slippery elm, pick, uh, pin oak, swamp white oak, uh, in the overstory. Shrubs such as winterberry holly, northern arrowwood, and highbush blueberry in the shrub layer, and a great variety of herbaceous, that is non-woody, plants on the swamp floor. We also have conifer-dominated swamps in the region with such trees as eastern hemlock or eastern red cedar in the overstory, but these are much less common. Swamps are extremely variable in their appearance and their plant community, some with long-standing water and with much of the vegetation raised on woody hummocks, uh, like in the left photo, and some that rarely have standing water at all, like the one on the right. <laughs> some are quite sparsely vegetated, and some are so dense and tangled that you can hardly walk through them. Like other forested habitats in the region, hardwood swamps support a wonderful array of wildlife, including frogs, salamanders, sometimes fish, snakes, and nesting songbirds and raptors, white-tailed deer forage in swamps, and bobcat, foxes, and coyotes hunt in swamps, swamps for mice, voles, and other small animals. Wood duck often nests in tree cavities of hardwood swamps, and red-shouldered hawk, a threatened species in New York, seems to prefer nesting in or near swamps that are part of large forested areas. Four-toed salamander, uncommon in the region, hangs out in swamps that have lots of moss-covered logs and rocks. A shrub swamp is a wetland dominated by shrubs, such as <coughs> winterberry holly, highbush blueberry, swamp azalea, alders, and buttonbush. This is a common habitat throughout the region and is often interspersed <coughs> uh, with or adjacent to other kinds of wetlands. Shrub swamps are every bit as variable as forested swamps <coughs> in their hydro periods and plant communities and support equally diverse species of plants and animals. For example, common shrub nesting birds, uh, such as common yellow throat, uh, and less common species such as alder flycatcher and golden winged warbler, which is a New York State species of special concern. Spotted turtle, also a special concern species. And northern ribbon snake use shrub swamps and other kinds of wetlands intermittently for, for foraging. A vernal pool <coughs> is usually a small wetland that is isolated from larger wetlands and from streams and that holds water in winter and spring but dries up at some time during the summer. The combination of the isolation and the seasonal drying 
ensure that the wetland does not support a fish population. Fish are big predators on amphibian eggs and larvae, and although many amphibian species have developed ways to cohabit with fish, uh, there's a special group of amphibians that requires these fish-free environments to, to sustain local populations. Uh, wood frog, spotted salamander, Jefferson salamander, and marbled salamander uh, in this region. The adults of these species spend most of the year in the upland forest habitats around the pool, but they use the vernal pool for breeding uh, and depositing their eggs in the spring. Marbled salamander actually deposits uh, their eggs in the fall and the eggs hatch out in uh, the following spring. After the eggs hatch, the tadpoles develop to a sub-adult stage in the pool over a period of two to three months, and then they too move out into the forest where they spend the rest of the year. In this way, both the vernal pool and the surrounding upland forest together are the critical habitat components for these amphibians. Uh, the marbled and the Jefferson salamanders are listed as New York State species of special concern. Vernal pools are also used by many other animals. Here's a spotted turtle which moves from one pool to another, taking advantage as the changing water levels make different kinds of prey available as the season proceeds. Many of these pools have rich invertebrate communities that includes dragonflies, water boatmen, ostracods and mosquitoes, those organisms that spend their entire lives here, such as fairy shrimp and fingernail clams, have special adaptations that allow them to withstand the seasonal drying. For example, some species leave the pool by the time it dries uh, in the early summer, and some enter a metabolic resting state that prevents them from desiccating during the dry periods. Vernal pools are one of the many kinds of small and isolated wetlands whose ecological and water resource values have been ignored, but are now receiving long overdue attention. In addition to all the invertebrates, which are valuable food sources for other animals, some vernal pools produce thousands of amphibians each year, which are prominent components of both the pool uh, and the forest ecosystem ecosystems. They consume invertebrates and fungi in the forest and are themselves prey to snakes, birds, and mammals. The technical definition of a marsh is a wetland that has standing water for a significant period during the growing season and is dominated by herbaceous, that is non-woody, vegetation. Typical plants of marshes are species such as cattails, pickerel weed, burr weed, pond lilies. Shown here are arrow arum, cattail, and reed canary grass. <laughs> Green frog, painted turtle, and snapping turtle are common inhabitants of marshes, and muskrat, northern water snake, and lots of other animals use marshes for some or all of their life cycles. Red-winged blackbird and swamp sparrow are common uh, birds of marshes. Green heron uh, nests in a wide variety of marshes, and both green and great blue herons feed in marshes of all kinds. Marshes are used by ducks and geese for nesting, nursery and foraging habitat, and for stopover habitat during spring and fall migrations. Marshes typically produce large numbers of flying insects, so bats, tree swallows and flycatchers are often seen hunting over marshes. Rare species of marshes include pied-billed grebe, which is a threatened species in New York. It nests in marshes adjacent to open water habitats. American black duck, a New York state species of greatest conservation need, nests in marshes with long-standing water. Least bittern, a threatened species. <clears throat> An American bittern, a species of special concern in New York, nest and forage in marshes with lots of cattails and other tall vegetation. A wet meadow 
is a wetland with little or no standing water through much of the growing season and is dominated by herbaceous vegetation. Wet meadows and marshes share some of the same plant species, but wet meadows have many plants adapted to drier conditions in marshes, such as fox sedge, soft rush, <laughs> sensitive fern, sweet flag, blue vervain, spotted joe pieweed, and smooth goldenrod, uh, among many others. <clears throat> Some are grassy and ferny, like the meadow on the left, and others have abundant forbs like purple loosestrife, spotted joe pieweed, and wetland goldenrods and asters, like the one on the right. The often abundant flowering plants are good nectar sources for native bees and honeybees, and for wasps, butterflies, and other pollinators. The Baltimore checker spot shown here is a regionally rare butterfly of wet meadows. <clears throat> Other animal inhabitants of wet meadows include frogs, turtles, snakes, and songbirds, American mink, hawks, owls, coyotes, and foxes hunt for meadow voles, frogs, and other small creatures in wet meadows. Dragonflies, damselflies, and bats hunt for flying insects over marshes. Uh, excuse me, over wet meadows. <clears throat> sedge wren, a New York State threatened species, nests in sedge dominated meadows, but very few nesting sites are known in the Hudson Valley. American woodcock, a New York State species of greatest conservation need, forages uh, in wet meadows and other moist habitats of, of meadows, shrub swamps, and forest edges. Smooth green snake and eastern ribbon snake, both are also species of greatest conservation need, often forage for frogs in wet meadows. <clears throat> wet meadows are common and widely distributed throughout the Hudson Valley landscape, occurring in hay fields and pastures, on uh, unforested floodplains like in this photo, in utility corridors, and in other managed and unmanaged open areas. <clears throat> because uh, like marshes, uh, wet meadows often produce large numbers of uh, flying insects. Uh, they are good foraging sites for several of our rare bat species, such as Indiana bat, Eastern small-footed bat, and, and hoary bat. Uh, these are all uh, rare species uh, in New York. A fen is an unusual kind of wet meadow or shrub swamp habitat, but what sets fens apart from other such habitats is that fens are fed by calcium-rich groundwater seepage, usually due to underlying limestone bedrock. And the constant seepage and the peculiar chemistry of the water and soils supports a distinctive community of plants, including some species that you're unlikely to see in any other habitats. <clears throat> Shrubby sink foil is one of the best indicators of a fen, although it sometimes occurs in highly calcareous upland habitats. If you see a lot of this plant in a wet area, you very likely have a fen. Some other typical fen plants are grass of Parnassus, green keeled cotton grass. Sorry about the phone. <clears throat> uh, porcupine sedge and bog goldenrod. Fens occur uh, only in a few regions of the Hudson Valley, mainly the Harlem Valley in areas with limestone bedrock uh, of the eastern tier of towns, and in parts of Orange County, although there are a few outlying areas. Fens are used by many of the same animals that use other kinds of wet meadows, but are also home to some rarities. Dion Skipper is an uncommon small butterfly whose larvae feed on sedges that are often abundant in fens. Bog valerian is a very rare plant of fens listed as endangered in New York. And fens are the core habitat of the bog turtle, our smallest native turtle and an endangered species in New York. It spends most of its life in fens and adjacent wetlands, but sometimes uh, needs to move overland to reach other fens. <clears throat> 
Most of our fens are in agricultural landscapes and many have been degraded by runoff from crop fields contaminated with fertilizers, which alter the nutrient balance in fens and ultimately uh, render the fens unsuitable for bog turtles uh, unless they are uh, managed in some way. A bog is an even rarer habitat in the Hudson Valley, although it is more common in the higher elevations of the Catskills and the Taconics. A bog is a wetland with more or less permanent standing water uh, or soil saturation, and the water is replenished mainly by precipitation, not by groundwater. The chemistry of bog soils and water can be either acidic or alkaline. But at either extreme, a bog develops an extensive mat of sphagnum mosses, sometimes anchored to the substrate and sometimes floating. Growing on the mat are plants that you're unlikely to find in other habitats, <laughs> such as leatherleaf, bog rosemary, cranberries, cotton grass, and three-seeded sedge. Among the curiosities of bogs are the insectivorous plants, such as pitcher plant, sundews and bladderworts, each with their special uh, mechanisms for attracting and consuming insects and other uh, tiny invertebrates. A seep is a place where groundwater emerges actively at the ground surface <laughs> under gravitational pressure. Some seeps flow only during or at, right after a rainstorm or snowmelt events. Some flow for longer periods and some flow all the time. Those that flow for prolonged periods during the growing season and support hydrophytic vegetation are wetlands. <clears throat> Seeps occur in a variety of landscape settings, on hillsides, at the toes of slopes, at the foots of ledges, uh, along stream sides, and in basins. Seeps constitute the highest headwaters of many of our streams. The water that originates from deep underground emerges at a fairly constant temperature between 45 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, creating a cool environment in the summer compared to surrounding habitats and a warmer environment in winter when many other surface water bodies are frozen. Lots of animals take advantage of seepage habitats <coughs> And the presence of certain plant species, such as golden saxifrage, uh, watercress, and forget-me-nots are often clues to the presence of groundwater seepage. There are many variations on each of these general habitat types that I've just described, and each will look and behave differently depending on the landscape setting, the nearby habitats, and other factors. <clears throat> I've mentioned only a few of the rare species that occur in Hudson Valley wetlands, but fully one third of the threatened and endangered plant and animal species in the US are wetland species. And nearly one half of the threatened and endangered species use wetlands at some point in their life cycle. I don't know the figures for New York State or the Hudson Valley, but they may be similar. So are wetlands more important for native uh, biodiversity than upland habitats? No, certainly not, although they sometimes seem more precious because we have already lost so many. Wetland and upland habitats are interdependent and ecologically inseparable, with much exchange of organisms, materials, and processes. For this reason, our land use planning and conservation efforts should treat wetland and upland areas as integrated holes, each uh, both serving the other and depending on the other. You can learn a little more about some of these habitats from habitat fact sheets that are available for viewing or downloading from Hudsonia's website. These describe many of the general habitat types in the region and how to recognize them, explain aspects of their ecological significance, uh, including some of the rare species they may support, uh, threats to each habitat, and recommendations for effective conservation. We encourage you to print them out uh, and give them to your colleagues, to land use applicants, uh, to landowners that you're working with, uh, and others. <clears throat>
Another good resource is the conservation guides of the New York Natural Heritage Program. This one describes hemlock uh, hardwood swamps <clears throat> and provides similar uh, information about where they occur, how to recognize them, their significance, and ideas for protection and management. The Heritage Program has similar conservation guides for animals of conservation concern in New York. <clears throat> we'll provide you with links to these and other documents at the end of the program. I want to say a few words uh, about wetlands and climate change. Wetlands can be much affected by the warming climate, uh, by the droughts, floods, heat waves, and the ecological disjunctures that, that are now happening, and are also essential to supporting the ecological resilience of the landscape. I think especially about the importance of three roles that they play in the current climate scenario. The carbon storage function that I mentioned earlier <clears throat> is an ongoing service provided by wetlands. As I said, wetlands can provide long-term storage of carbon in the sometimes deep layers of peat that develop especially in wetlands with more or less permanently saturated soils where decomposition is slowed to a crawl. This includes carbon fixed by photosynthesis within the wetland itself as well as carbon received from surrounding upland sources, leaves, twigs, branches, and herbaceous material from forests and meadows. Globally, wetlands store uh, roughly 225 billion metric tons of carbon, or the equivalent of carbon emissions from roughly 189 million cars every year. Drying, Draining or disruption of the wetland sediments can lead to rapid release of carbon to the atmosphere, but wetlands that are left undisturbed and undrained will continue to capture and store large amounts of carbon. Climate scientists predict more frequent and more prolonged droughts over the coming decades, which will mean dry stream beds, dry drinking water wells, and depleted reservoirs. In addition to storing large volumes of water and releasing it slowly to streams, some wetlands also serve a valuable role in recharging groundwater supplies. Their capability for serving this function depends on the landscape setting and the local geology, the porosity and permeability of the underlying loose material and rock. Wetlands underlain by sand and gravel deposits or bedrock with fractures and solution cavities ordinarily have much interaction with groundwater. Upland areas, that is non-wetlands, also uh, can serve this valuable function. Groundwater is not only the primary source of drinking water for most rural parts of the state, but is also a significant source of water for wetlands, streams, and upland habitats. Climate scientists also predict more frequent and more frequent large rainstorms causing catastrophic flood events that can be highly disruptive to human infrastructure, crops, and property. Many wetlands, because of their landscape setting and underlying geology, have high capacities for water storage and are providing this service to us daily, unseen and unappreciated. The large volumes of water stored in wetlands would otherwise be coursing down <clears throat> our streams and causing unimaginable damage to our developed landscapes. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> one acre of wetland can typically store about one and a half million gallons of water. Uh, you can picture this as four and a half acres of wetland covered with uh, water one foot deep. Small wetlands, isolated wetlands, and those high up in the watershed, the so-called headwater wetlands, can be every bit as important as larger wetlands and those in <coughs> floodplains for storing water, for recharging groundwater, and for preventing and reducing large floods and, and flood damage. The cumulative water storage volumes of small and isolated wetlands are immense. 
Now, when large floods and extended droughts are becoming commonplace, <clears throat> these seem like excellent arguments for protecting uh, wetlands of all kinds, including uh, small and isolated wetlands, uh, with the same urgency that we've been protecting large wetlands and those obviously connected to uh, streams and rivers. In this era, uh, when the effects of climate change are becoming more evident every day, the special habitat conditions offered by, by wetlands may be particularly important uh, to plants and animals. <clears throat> wetlands of all kinds, including small and isolated wetlands, can provide thermal refuge for both terrestrial and aquatic species seeking relief from unaccustomed uh, warm temperatures. Wetlands that are fed by springs and seeps can be especially valuable for this purpose. And wetlands and streams, both small and large, can provide cool, moist travel corridors for animals and plants that need to migrate to cooler habitats as their traditional habitats are rendered unsuitable by the warming climate. All of this is in addition to the essential habitats provided by these wetlands for plants and animals, including the rare species that will be most vulnerable to the effects of climate change because many are already existing near the limits of their environmental tolerances. So most of this talk so far has been about inland wetlands, but I, I don't mean to ignore the significance of the wetlands along the tidal Hudson River for the ecology and water quality of the Hudson River and for our developed shorelines. <clears throat> These tidal wetlands provide habitat for practically all the animals that use the Hudson River, uh, the fish, shorebirds, wading birds, songbirds, raptors, muskrat, beaver, otter, mink, mollusks, and all the macro and, and micro invertebrates that are so essential to the food webs of the river ecosystem. These wetlands, like their inland counterparts, also serve us daily in their processing and transformation of pollutants and in their absorbing uh, absorption and buffering of storm surges. This is a cross section of the Hudson River uh, near shore and shoreline. <laughs> the subtidal area is continuously inundated, merely becoming deeper and shallower with the twice daily tides. The intertidal area is flooded twice daily at high tide <clears throat> and exposed twice daily at low tide. This is the zone of the tidal mudflats, marshes, and tidal swamps along the river. The supratidal zone is flooded only dur during large storm surges, the highest high tides or large runoff events. And then there is the adjacent upland zone. With the rising sea level, the hydro period of each of the tidal and supratidal zones is shifting landward. So areas that are now upland may become supratidal and parts of the supratidal zone may become more regularly intertidal and so forth. Some of the tidal wetlands will be slowly drowned as the intertidal zone becomes subtidal. This is another view of those zones. <clears throat> In places where the upland zone slopes gently up from the supertidal, there are opportunities for the tidal zones to migrate landward, creating new tidal habitats over time. But where the upland zone is vertical rock, or where we have hardened the shoreline with seawalls and bulkheads, that migration is impossible and the tidal wetlands and supertidal hab habitats may simply be lost. There are exceptions <clears throat> to this scenario, however. Sediments are regularly washing into the Hudson from tributaries. Some remain suspended in the water column, giving the Hudson its perpetually muddy appearance, but some are deposited in bays, backwaters, and other areas of reduced tidal energy. The buildup of sediments and accumulation of organic material from wetland vegetation in these areas raises the elevations of tidal habitats and where this accretion is occurring at rates matching the rate of sea level rise, the tidal wetlands and mudflats are likely to persist. <clears throat> 
Sea level has risen about one foot in the last century, but predictions are that sea level could rise three to six feet uh, in this century, which would far outpace the rate of historic sediment accretion in the tidal wetlands, where the rate of accretion does not keep up with the rate of tidal, of uh, sorry, sea level rise, tidal wetlands and mudflats will be drowned. In fact, we expect that both scenarios will occur in different parts of the Hudson River estuary, but the net loss of tidal wetlands uh, is likely. Scenic Hudson has used data from the 2014 ClimAid report to predict the effects of sea level rise along the tidal Hudson. For example, this map based on the scenic Hudson analysis is taken from the City of Hudson Open Space and Natural Resource Inventory and shows the tidal wetland extent in, in 2007 in green. Uh, the areas where landward migration may create new wetlands by 2100 in orange and where the rising sea level will conflict with existing developed areas in red. If you want to view such a map for other areas of the Hudson River shoreline, Scenic Hudson's sea level rise mapper allows you to do so <clears throat> uh, and to adjust the predictions uh, according to different scenarios and the timing of sea level rise. For example, let's see the predicted event of the 100 year floodplain with 12 inches of sea level rise in the vicinity of the Mid Hudson Bridge in Poughkeepsie. This is the area shown in orange. <clears throat> you can do this for any other parts of the Hudson River shoreline. I'm just going to back up a second. There's the, the shoreline. The areas in orange uh, are uh, with a 12 inches of sea level rise at the 100 year floodplain. This analysis is explained in a scenic Hudson document called Protecting the Pathways, which also gives some recommendations for local land use planning and policy making in the shoreline communities. Anticipating the climate change effects uh, of increasingly higher temperatures, <clears throat> more extended droughts, larger and more frequent storms and flooding, rising sea level, uh, and desynchronized interactions between organisms and their environments. <clears throat> um, with those, uh, with those predictions, we uh, encourage uh, wherever possible. Um, uh, protecting and restoring wetlands <clears throat> to help maintain surface water and groundwater supplies, to maintain essential habitats for plants or animals, to provide refuge from uh, warmer temperatures, to provide travel ways for wildlife and plants, to reduce flood damage to farmland infrastructure and buildings, uh, <clears throat> and to to also to maintain undeveloped shorelines and to rewild shoreline zones, um, which will allow landward migration of, of tidal wetlands. For both wetland and upland habitats, <clears throat> those that are left undisturbed by us and maintain a complex vegetation structure, diverse microhabitats, and their full complement of native species will be best equipped to respond to the many stresses of climate change, including extremes of heat and cold, wetness and drought, loss of species, desynchronization of plants and pollinators, predators and prey, and the many other known and yet unforeseen effects of climate change. In addition to avoiding direct disturbance of plants, animals, or soils, one of the best ways to protect wetlands is by maintaining broad buffer zones of undisturbed uh, vegetation and soils at their perimeters. A buffer zone helps to protect uh, the wetland from noise, lights, pets, and other disturbance from human activities, and can also help to intercept sediments and cleanse surface runoff of nutrients and other contaminants <clears throat> before they reach the wetland. 
An undisturbed zone around a wetland also provides habitat for animals that use both wetland and terrestrial environments. The science of buffer zones is complex and the widths of effective buffer zones will vary according to nearby land uses, the local conditions of soils, slopes, vegetation, and disturbance, and the sensitivities of the particular habitats and species that you're trying to protect. <clears throat> this is a very useful document published by the Environmental Law Institute that explains some of this complexity and provides some practical ideas for establishing effective buffer zones for different purposes. For example, <clears throat> this graph shows some recommended buffer widths for different purposes based on the scientific literature. Uh, for settling sediments before they reach the wetland, for removing nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, and providing wildlife habitat. The skinny part of each of those bars represents the range of potentially effective buffer widths for each function, and the thick part of the bar represents the buffer widths that may most effectively accomplish each of those functions. Notice that there is a very large range of widths that may serve to protect wildlife habitats, this is because of the dramatically different needs of different kinds of wildlife. In some cases, the need for broad buffer zones has to do with the ter territorial needs <coughs> uh, of uh, wildlife or the habitat complexes that are required by animals that use both wetland and the nearby upland habitats. The utility of buffer zones for wildlife and plants is also related to the problem of habitat edges. A habitat edge is the part of the habitat that is near its perimeter where the environmental conditions <coughs> are much affected by influences from the surrounding areas. We use the term edge effects for the negative influence of habitat edges on conditions in the habitat interior. <clears throat> and the habitat interior or core is the part of the habitat that is far enough from the edge that those influences are not felt or are minimally felt. For example, forest edges tend to be warmer, brighter, <coughs> drier, and windier than forest interiors and are often occupied in part uh, by non-native plants. Edges of forests, meadows, and including wetlands are often patrolled by predators that avoid the habitat interior. Habitat patches with, le with less core habitat expose uh, some vulnerable animals to the inhospitable conditions of edges and make it harder for those vulnerable populations to persist. The extent and influence of edges uh, edge effects vary according to the amount uh, of contrast uh, between adjacent habitats, the kinds of edge disturbances, uh, the kinds of vegetation, uh, and the sensitivities of interior species. There is much evidence in the scientific literature that edge effects on uh, on many kinds of wildlife extend 100 meters and more uh, into a forest, for example. <clears throat> Here's an example of uh, how those edge effects can act to reduce the amount of core habitat in a 60-acre forested swamp. There are roads and a number of occupied houses and yards in the upland area around the swamp. If we assume that the various edge effects extend at least 330 feet into the swamp, then we would be left with only <clears throat> this small patch of core habitat, just 10 acres in the interior. If we really wanted to protect such a swamp, uh, we would establish a 330 foot buffer zone, <clears throat> such as this area outlined in blue, beyond the outside edge. So we've talked about the importance of wetlands for maintaining clean and abundant <clears throat> uh, water supplies, for carbon storage and climate resilience, and for habitats of plants and animals, including many rare species and other species of conservation concern. <clears throat> 
we talked a little about buffer zones for wetlands. Although there has been growing concern about wetlands in recent decades, large areas of wetland are still being lost to draining or filling or degraded by our nearby land uses. Many of our small and isolated wetlands are entirely unprotected by local, state, and federal wetland laws, despite the great importance to surrounding terrestrial areas, to streams and groundwater, and as habitats in their, in their own right. We'll talk more about existing protections tomorrow and on day three, we'll talk about adopting local laws to improve wetland protections at the local level. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions before we go on to the, the next segment um, on uh, threats to habitats. I'm gonna return this screen to, oops. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, we're, we can maybe take w one question and then turn it over to Nate. And we can hold additional questions if you want to type questions into the chat box. We'll hold them for 4.30 when we'll have uh, a longer Q&A period uh, for anyone who wants to keep discussing. Um, so there's a, a question I see in the chat um, about distinguishing a seep versus a spring. That's a good quick one. Yes, um, a, a spring is a place where groundwater emerges at the ground surface uh, at a single point and a seep is where it, merge, it, where it emerges diffusely. Uh, springs and seeps are very closely related to each other. Uh, they occur together. You could think of a seep as a place where many little springs uh, emerge uh, together in a single uh, geographic area. Thanks, Gretchen. Uh, well, thank you so much. We're going to um, move along and our next speaker is Nate Nardi Cyrus. So take it away, Nate. All right. Well, thank you, Ingrid, and thanks, Gretchen, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to try to move pretty quickly so we can have some time for questions at the end. Um, but I'm going to go over some threats to wetlands. Uh, Gretchen covered many of them, but I'll go into some more detail on, on certain threats um, and then hopefully have some time to, uh, you know, introduce some of the things we can do to help uh, uh, mitigate some of those threats. Um, so what are the threats? Uh, I'm going to talk about each of these individually, but uh, one major one is hydrologic alteration. We have pollutants, invasive species, inadequate buffers. Uh, Gretchen talked quite a bit about that. Um, and then fragmentation, which I won't cover, but, but Gretchen did discuss the, you know, the fragmentation of the hydrology of wetlands and the, uh, the habitat functions um, obviously threaten uh, many aspects of wetlands. So first looking at hydrologic alteration, this is a pretty fancy word um, and a fancy definition, but all this really means is just how uh, humans and society have uh, altered the, the natural flow of water through the landscape. We're all pretty familiar with the water cycle in which water evaporates from uh, the surface of the earth, including oceans, and then uh, rains back down from clouds and, and you know, travels through streams and, and subsurface flows um, back to those large reservoirs. Um, and, the, and the infographic on the right just kind of shows the many ways that, that humans alter that flow, either by you know, pulling water out for their own use, um, for diverting water, um, and, and just other various modifications to the landscape. So we'll talk about a couple examples of this. Uh, primary one is uh, draining. Many people are familiar with this. It's typically done for uh, in agricultural settings. These images are from uh, the Orange County black dirt region of New York. Uh, and if anyone's ever been there before, you'll see these extensive series of ditches and pump houses. Um, and so, you know, this, this was historically a very large uh, a wetland complex, uh, again, down in Orange County in the Warwick area. Um, and, you know, but also has very fertile soil. So uh, again, in those kind of places where, um, where soils can be drained for agriculture, uh, that can threaten wetlands because without water, um, you know, they're unable to support hydrophytic vegetation. 
Another example, uh, which is a little less intuitive, is just the increase in impervious surface in the in the watershed uh, or those areas draining into a wetland. Um, so an example of this might be, you know, you, you create a new subdivision that's not immediately adjacent to a wetland, but within that drainage area, uh, and you have storm drains such as this, um, you know, they have some kind of outfall into the woods and eventually they end up running into wetlands. Um, and you know this can impact those wetlands in several ways. Uh, a really notable way is that uh, be because that water is not allowed to uh, penetrate through that impervious surface and kind of slowly uh, recharge that wetland over a longer period of time, um, you have all of that uh, water running directly into the wetlands, so you can have uh, more extensive floods, um, but also on the on the converse side of that, you can have periods of drying that, that are uh, atypical for that setting. Uh, another example is just the direct disturbance to the wetlands themselves that can definitely alter flow and, and, and just damage those wetlands themselves. Um, here we have, you know, uh, a, a situation on an ATV that, that looks a bit unpleasant, um, but also large equipment, um, you know, the staging of equipment and, and the crossing of wetlands um, in things like forestry operations where, you know, working when the ground is frozen is often better or some kind of uh, crossing structure uh, should be mandated. Uh, if that doesn't happen, you can get uh, issues like this where, where there's direct disturbance to that wetland. Uh, obviously, there's there's filling and conversion, and we'll talk a little bit about the types of wetlands that are more susceptible to this. Uh, there are some um, protections against these kind of activities, but they typically don't focus on on smaller wetlands. And so here in this example, you see the placement of fill, um, but it's a it's a very small wetland um, that likely uh, and, and not connected, so very likely not um, subject to uh, regulatory protections. Um, and then likewise, you know, after that, that fill occurs, um, there can often be conversion and, and development on top of that. Uh, pond creation, many people think of ponds as being, you know, a positive feature for wildlife. Um, and they do benefit some wildlife, uh, particularly things like waterfowl. Um, but uh, unfortunately, they, they seldom kind of reproduce the, uh, the wetland that they replaced, right? Because, you know, to create a pond, you have to dig out an area. And, it, and, and often these ponds are situated in, in areas that were formerly wetlands. So the act of pond creation itself um, can, can be a threat. Uh, this is a, an interesting one. Uh, uh, beaver removal. So, uh, you know, beaver were, have been in our landscape for thousands of years and, um, you know, we're, we're nearly extirpated um, because of just their, the value of their pelts and, and the over exploitation of that resource. Um, once they uh, started re returning to the landscape, uh, they had a lot of positive effects. Um, Namely, uh, the, their strong association with uh, great blue herons. Everyone, everyone loves these kind of charismatic large birds. Um, and, and really, they're kind of seeing, we see so many of them on the landscape these days. And, and a lot of that can be attributed to the activities of, of beavers. You know, they'll uh, inundate, uh, 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 create these, uh, these beaver ponds um, by, by blocking streams and creating their own wetland, artificial wetlands. And in doing so, they, they kill off um, large trees, which the heron uh, are required to have to to breed. They breed in these rookeries or kind of a large congregation of nests. Um, so the removal of beavers, you know, can have a, a really a large landscape level impact to to wetlands in the region. Uh, this is a, a fairly obvious one, but water withdrawal. If you you know if you cite a well that might be uh, there for supplying drinking water or um, in an agricultural setting for irrigation, even in, in an industrial setting that uses high uh, water volumes, um, you know that that well is going to generate what's called a cone of depression, and you can see that on the right hand side here. Um, and and often these are cited close to bodies of water because the water table is is lower in these places. Um, and where that uh, depression cone intersects with a wetland, um, you know you can get drying out of those wetlands, especially in in, in uh, periods of the late summer. Uh, I won't go too much into uh, inadequate 
natural buffers because uh, Gretchen covered that pretty well. Um, but uh, you can see here, these are two examples of uh, intermittent woodland pools. So those generally have a suite of species that require not just the wetland, but that kind of larger buffer area in order to persist. That includes uh, some of the mole salamanders like spotted salamander, uh, wood frog, species like that. And here you, you can see without the adjacent uplands, you know, they may have some trees immediately adjacent to the wetland, but the, the function of that wetland, at least biologically, is going to be greatly diminished. Um, I'll also note the wetland on the right, actually, I, I know personally, um, I did some water quality testing on, on about 150 vernal pools in the Mid-Hudson region, um, and this pool here that's immediately adjacent to this kind of like windy mountain road uh, you know, had one of the highest concentrations of uh, salt and uh, it seemed anecdotally anyway to have some impact on um, the number of amphibians breeding uh, in this pool. So uh, again you know, the buffer uh, just the, the lack of having upland is important but also you know having kind of uh, human created features immediately adjacent to wetlands are also problematic. Uh, we have pollutants. Um, point source pollutants are what many people might be familiar with and what might think of. An example of this would be a consolidated sewer overflow um, where, you know, uh, in, in events of, of, of high precipitation, uh, additional water is combined with sewage and, and, and discharged at permitted uh, uh, kind of outfalls. And, uh, you know, Many of these are, are into our, our major rivers and, and, and likewise this can affect uh, the wetlands that are adjacent to those areas. Um, there's many other types of kind of regulated outfalls that, that, that can provide a point source for pollution. Um, much more insidious and widespread threat is non-point source. This includes um, things like runoff uh, from, from fer lawn fertilizer, something like that. Uh, can include failing septic systems that, that aren't proper, properly processing the, uh, the waste coming out of them, uh, or dumping, just, uh, you know, kind of scattered dumping of, of uh, things like refrigerators or uh, things that have pollutants, um, oftentimes they're easy to kind of dump off the side of a ledge and, and those are the places that, that wetlands often are at the bottom of these kind of ravines. I'm not going to go into invasive species a lot. I have two examples here. Um, both definitely uh, affect wetlands um, in our region. Um, knotweed is, uh, you know, particularly insidious and spreads easily and, and, and leads to all kinds of erosion issues. Uh, and emerald ash borer just kind of goes to show this is an insect that, that kills ash trees, which are um, one of the major components of, of our wetlands in the Northeast. Um, and just so, uh, you know, uh, uh, any kind of pest that, that damages a single tree to the point where it's removed from the landscape is going to have impacts um, on the wetlands that were associated with that species. Uh, and I will make a note that, you know, for more information on invasive species, uh, it's important to coordinate or get in touch with your local um, partnership for regional invasive species management. These are set up by the state um, prisms. Uh, in our region, uh, the lower Hudson prism kind of covers up into Ulster, uh, roughly Ulster Dutchess County, capital Mohawk is in the north uh, of that, and then the CRISP, which is the Catskill prism that covers uh, the areas in the Catskill Mountains. Uh, Gretchen did a great job going into climate change. So again, I'm not going to go into a ton of depth here. Um, you know, she discussed changes in rainfall. So we have drought, uh, increased instances of drought and flood. That's obviously going to affect the hydro period of wetlands. Um, but then also extremes in temperatures, freezing and drying. Uh, I thought I'd bring up this example, which kind of goes back to the work I did with some vernal pools and in the mid Hudson uh, region. So uh, this hap isn't an anecdotal thing that happened um, one season. So you have uh, kind of an early spring. We're all familiar with these, the thaw starts you get that that burst of uh, uh pool, uh, intermittent woodland pool obligate species. Um, wood frogs come into the pool, especially early, um, and then uh, all of a sudden winter resumes and that pool freezes over completely. And so you end up having uh, a mass mortality event. Um, and, you know, that might be something that's a, a natural thing. Uh, you know, there's always kind of freezes uh, in that part of the winter, but when you have this highly erratic sort of um, issues due to climate change, you have higher instances of these kind of stressful events for populations of species. Um, so that's just one example of many that climate change uh, threaten.
Um, and then sea level rise, this is an example of, uh, you know, Constitution Marsh. This is from that scenic Hudson uh, marsh migration um, story map. Uh, and you can see here red is, uh, you know, most likely to be lost uh, and going down to the lighter color purple, which, you know, has some of the least likely uh, chances of being lost. And really what you can see is that most of Constitution Marsh looks like it's, um, it's, it's, going to be lost because of those steep banks that don't allow it to migrate inland. Um, and there are some areas where, you know, this lighter blue is kind of areas where it could migrate upland um, along Constitution Island and up into Foundry Cove. But um, for the most part, uh, the, these wetlands uh, look like that they're probably going to be flooded for the most part and at least change in, in where the difference in which types of tidal wetlands occur here. Um, that being said, places like in the northern part of the estuary, uh, those areas in, you know, Columbia County, um, and Green County northward uh, generally have a, a higher potential for marsh migration. So overall, there, there may even be an increase in tidal wetlands, um, but unfortunately, the, the highlands are not likely to benefit from that. Okay, so I'm going to end this threat section with just taking it down to this individual species level. Um, that helps me kind of understand, uh, you know, what threatens uh, a wetland is what threatens the inhabitants of that. So in this case, we're going to look at what threatens the spotted salamander. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, vernal pools or in intermittent woodland pools in this talk. Um, so we'll kind of see a potential uh, a series of threats that could harm it. So here you have some salamanders coming into the pool to breed. It's a nice early spring day. They look so happy um, <laughs> as they move into the pool. Um, but, you know, you might think putting a single house in may not cause too much trouble to this pool. And it might not right away. Um, but, you, you know, you've got this dog running around. And it looks a lot like my dog, actually. And he's, uh, you know not a friend to wildlife for the most part, um, in my experience. Uh, you may have some mortality um, from the new road that had to go in. It may seem just like a single road through the woods couldn't cause too much harm, but in this case, um, it really could uh, as the salamanders move into the pool to breed in the spring and then as they exit. Um, you know, that house is going to create a lot of pollution, um, or at least some pollution, uh, and that's likely to run off into the pool and collect, and, and that will definitely affect things like salamanders who have uh, really kind of thin, porous skin that transfers uh, uh, pollutants uh, into it very easily. Um, another example with the house could provide would be the, uh, the well that goes in there um, that could potentially drain this pool early and the, the eggs that are developing in that pool, um, they have a very limited time to develop. Those might dry out before they're able to fully uh, uh, you know, hatch into larva and then, and then um, fully mature salamanders. Uh, invasive species, you know, more people, more animals, uh, the movement of things like ronavirus through the landscape could get exacerbated as, as there's just more activity on the site. Um, my favorite, the pond creation, a uh, nice spot to put a pond uh, that doesn't ever dry up if you dig that out a little deeper. Um, once that pond goes in there, again, the salamander still might be able to persist, but if uh, fish finally can get into that pond, um, they will predate on those, um, uh, on those eggs. And again, that can cause the uh, extinction of that local population. And, and of course, climate change um, will do all kinds of things at the very least, uh, potentially uh, drying that pool out sooner um, or causing one of those freeze events that we talked about earlier. So uh, that's, that's a little bit of gloom and doom, but I do want to end on a, on a happy note. You know, how do we protect uh, our wetlands from these, these series of, of, of threats? Uh, I'll go into that a little bit before I end. Um, so I've divided protection into kind of two types. We have voluntary protections. You know, these are um, kind of um, how we can uh, uh, work with landowners to, to do good stewardship acts um, and to uh, uh, make sure that development is planned in a way that helps to protect these resources. And then, of course, there's regulatory uh, approaches. And we're going to go much more into depth into the regulatory approaches in um, the subsequent two days. So I'll, I'll stay a little light on that. So, of course, there's voluntary conservation. Uh, the protection of land as parks and preserves um, is something that isn't 
mandated. Um, it can be a part of regulation, but um, for the most part, uh, it's it's largely voluntary. Um, and so once a park is or preserve is created, it's important that the managers of those um, parks and preserves uh, take a good inventory of all of their wetlands. Any resources available at the regional or state level probably aren't good at this local site level. Um, so doing your own series of uh, a mapping of watercourses and wetlands as sensitive features um, can really help inform management going forward. Um, also, protection could occur through conservation easements. These are uh, voluntary legal agreements between uh, a landowner um, and uh, an entity that holds that easement, uh, and they're per it, generally they're perpetual. So they exist uh, across many landowners throughout time, um, in in many cases forever. So, uh, you know, a resource understanding where wetlands are is important. You have a resource like this one that you can kind of see the wetland here. Um, you might have a special zone in that easement that has specific terms that um, that kind of are more restrictive and can help protect that wetland. Some examples here I have are, you know, it might be a farm property, but it limits livestock grazing, soil cult uh, cultivation, uh, and, and things like tree cutting. Um, these are some, uh, could be voluntary, could be regulatory uh, stewardship actions, uh, reduction of impervious surface through um, site planning or, uh, you know, through voluntary measures, um, the installation of green infrastructure. So we, going back to, um, uh, you know, reducing impervious surface. Uh, things like rain gardens can help to uh, slow down water and make sure that it percolates into the soil and, and can recharge these wetlands. Um, and creating some kind of buffer area. Uh, this isn't the best buffer area, but there's been some attempt to keep, um, you know, uh, grazing cattle out of the wetland and um, anything that you can do to, um, you know, protect the water quality of the wetland and to maintain as much upland habitat adjacent, um, that is going to definitely benefit the wetland. Uh, of course, things like uh, education, um, uh, are, can, can be really helpful things like this or um, even uh, groups like CACs or land trusts doing uh, other educational events to, to you know, spread the word about the types of uh, uh, stewardship people can do and, and just the values of wetlands in and of themselves. Um, discouragement of dumping. This is something that a, a, a property owner or a land trust can do is just stepping up their uh, enforcement of easements or um, they're just the monitoring of their own park boundaries because you know, these kind of dumping issues are, are common and widespread and, and can have a cumulative effect downstream. Uh, the siting of trails, that's something again that this gets at uh, very specific getting at um, uh, like things like land trusts or private landowners, making sure that, you know, trails generally avoid wetlands, but if they do pass through wetlands that they use some kind of crossing structure uh, so that the wetland soils and vegetation themselves aren't damaged. Um, and uh, another thing, which again, this is getting to kind of the higher levels is uh, restoration could occur. This is a floodplain restoration. Um, uh, that, that added a, a lot of wetland plants to uh, a formerly uh, uh, lawn area. And you can see uh, my old intern there using a flame torch to burn uh, Japanese uh, or uh, uh, multi-flora rose out of that, that floodplain. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I assume we're a little behind. So I will uh, cede my time to 